Thanks. All right, so uh, how many of you guys have seen 21 or read the book, Bring Down the House? So you all know what I like to call Hollywood magic, and I mean true Hollywood magic is how you turn an average-looking Asian-American male into a dashing British white guy, <laughs> because that's what they did in the movie. Um, I was the basis for the main character in the book and in the movie. Um, it all started in 2001. A friend of mine by the name of Ben Mesrick, who he was an author, a writer at the time, and he'd written seven books, but it's fair to say that his career at that time was pretty much in the shitter. Um, and Ben had business school applications out and was contemplating not being a writer anymore. And I approached him and I said, Ben, I have a great idea for your next book. And he said, well, what is it? And I said, me and my buddies from IT, we go to Vegas and we use math to beat the casinos and we win lots of money. And he, this sort of dull, glossy look went over his face and he said, I don't know if anyone wants to read a book about a bunch of MIT nerds. And then about, and first of all, like if you've ever seen this guy, he went to Harvard and he is worse than any of my friends. So um, anyway, so Ben, uh, about six weeks later, goes with me to Vegas and says, oh my God, this is the coolest thing, we should write a book about this. So we then approach his editors and his editors say, you know what, it sounds like a fun story, but I don't think anyone wants to read a book about a bunch of MIT nerds. Well, we ignored her and wrote a book called uh, Bring Down the House, and it was a New York Times bestseller for over a year. And the guy by the name of Kevin Spacey read the book and liked it so much that he turned it into a movie called 21, and 21 was number one in the box office two weeks in a row and made $150 million off a $35 million budget. So in the end, I guess people did want to read a book and see a movie about a bunch of MIT nerds, which was cool. Ben Mezrick has since gone on to write a book called The Accidental Billionaires, which got turned into a movie called The Social Network, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, which won an Oscar. So Ben Mezrick essentially won an Oscar, but I can say I made Ben Mezrick who he is today. So <laughs> he doesn't always agree with me. So I always like to tell a few stories that weren't in the book and weren't in the movie. So how many of you guys are, are familiar? Have you been, for, for a lot of you guys as developers and going into new worlds, like you have emerging markets. Well, for card counters like ourselves, the emerging markets were the opening of any casino. So at the opening of any new casino, you always have three types of people there. Okay, the first are card counters, the second are celebrities. Can anyone guess the third type of person that you always see at the opening of any casino? Wait, who said it? It's over there. there. Stand up. Go ahead. What is it? Poker. Yeah, very good. Yeah. <laughs> you can tell a lot about a crowd how, by how quickly they get that answer. I was at a real estate conference in Orange County, and no sooner had the words come out of my mouth than a woman from the back row screams, hookers! And then there's always one guy that can't resist himself, and I usually make them stand up. And in many corporate settings, they realize that that was probably their career-limiting maneuver. So... <laughs> Anyway, so I'm at the opening of the Bellagio in, in the late 90s, and I have the pleasure of playing blackjack with uh, Kevin Costner and his crew of friends. And Kevin is a pretty good blackjack player, meaning he does the right thing most of the time, but then he starts to lose. And literally, for like 15 minutes straight, he loses every hand. And every hand he loses, his friends look at me and say, God, this is like Waterworld all over again. My second favorite story actually comes from uh, the first NBA lockout. So in the late 90s, we're playing blackjack, and uh, the NBA owners decided to lock out their players. Well, where do you think NBA players go when they can't play basketball? Well, they go to casinos. And I walked into Foxwoods Casino one day, and there was a big fight happening, and I had the pleasure of playing uh, blackjack with Alan Houston and John Starks. And any of you guys are Knicks fans, remember these guys, Patrick Ewing, these are the old Knicks. And John Starks was sort of this gritty guy from the streets. And I remember he sits down next to me at the blackjack table, and the first thing he does is order a bottle of Merlot, which I thought was sort of a strange thing for this tough, you know, basketball player to be drinking. I've since learned that you never know what an NBA player is going to drink. I was in um, Vegas playing craps about six or seven years ago, and there was a guy by the name of Jalen Rose, who you now see on ESPN all the time. He had just retired from the NBA, where he played for about 75 different teams. And Jalen um, and I started playing craps together. And at the time, I was working in sports. And Jalen said, hey, Jeff. And he was trying to break into sports. So he said, hey, can we grab a drink together? And I said, well, what do you want to drink? And he says, whatever you want to drink. And I'm like, here I am, kind of starstruck by this NBA player that I've watched on television, you know, Fab Five, all this kind of stuff. Don't want to order something stupid. My one data point is that John Starks drinks Merlot. I don't want to order Merlot. I have visions of rap videos going through my head. I turn to the waitress and I say, Give me two glasses of Covassier. To this day, I still don't know what Covassier is. I just know it's in a song. 
So anyway, so I, the waitress starts to walk away, and Jalen Rose, with his nine-foot-long arms, grabs her and says, excuse me, ma'am, could you make mine an apple martini, please? So <laughs> anyways, back to John Stark. So John is here, and he goes through this transformation that I'm sure so, many, some of you have seen your friends go through, where you start as this sober, intelligent human being, and after five or six hours, become a drunk, degenerate gambler. So John is all out of money and puts his last $500 down in the betting circle. The dealer gives him an allowance. How many of you guys play blackjack or familiar with blackjack? OK. So the dealer gives him an 11, and the dealer has a six up. So what do you guys got to do in that situation? All right, you need to put another $500 down, and the dealer just gives you one card. So John starts searching through his pockets again. And of course, he doesn't have any money because so, he ran out of money. So I flip him a $500 chip, and I say, pay me back when you win. The dealer gives him a five to make 16. John looks at me and goes, man, you just jinxed me. And I said, don't worry, because of course I'm counting cards, so I still think there's a good chance the dealer's going to lose and bust. <laughs> the dealer flips a 10 to make 16 and gets a 10 to make 26. John pays me back my $500 without a word of thank you, and it was that day I decided I would never have John Starks on my fantasy basketball team. So <laughs> I really showed him. Uh-oh. Okay, so those of you guys who have seen 21, you guys know that I'm in the movie, right? Yeah. I'm in the movie, all right? <laughs> this is like super, this is like the most disappointing two minutes of my day always. I'm in the movie, I play a dealer named Jeffrey. The guy that plays me walks up to me and says, Jeffrey, my brother from another mother, we have a witty back and forth, I have three lines, I now have a SAG card, this is not ringing any bells to you people, is it? <laughs> Well, this wonderful scene, and if you want to go back and watch it, it's at about 59 minutes and three seconds. But <laughs> this wonderful scene that none of you guys seem to remember took three days to film. And the second day that I was out there, the cast of the movie, so this is Lawrence Fishburne and Kate Bosworth, they come up to me and they say, hey, Jeff, um, we want to take you out to dinner tonight for letting us tell your story on the big screen. A thank you. I said, that'd be really cool. And then on the way over to dinner, and keep in mind I'm 30 and single right now, Kate Bosworth pulls me aside and she says, hey, Jeff. I've got a really fun idea for what you and I can do after dinner. And I'm like, OK, Kate, tell me more. And she goes, I think it'd be really fun if all of us go play blackjack together, and you can coach us, and we can win lots of money. <laughs> <clears throat> and I was like, Kate, first of all, it's not what I was hoping for. Second of all, it's a bad idea. And she said, why? And I said, we're going to the Palms. They know me very well there. There's nowhere they're going to let me play blackjack there. And she said, it's OK. You'll be with me. I'm a big star. They won't bother you. And I said, Kate, it's been a long time since Blue Crush. I don't know what a big star you are anymore. <laughs> but After six bottles of wine, what seemed like a terrible idea seems like this great idea. And we go upstairs to the Playboy Club at the Palms. And we sit down to start playing blackjack. And the floor person walks up to me and he says, Jeff, what are you doing? And I said, I'm here to play blackjack with Kate Bosworth, big star, Blue Crush, no big deal, right? And he says, let me check. And he calls upstairs and he says, not only are you not allowed to play blackjack, but if your little friend Kate's at the table, you're not allowed to be within 20 feet of the table. Which was cool, because it gave me a lot of street cred with Kate. She thought it was dangerous. But it didn't <laughs> get me anywhere with her, but at least she thought it was dangerous and cool. OK, so let's talk to some serious things. So when I, uh, the, the MIT blackjack team basically was a group of us that used math to beat the casinos, used data-driven decisions. I'm sure a lot of you guys are in the big data world or familiar with the big data world. Well, this was big data before there was even such a term. Like, blackjack is kind of the ultimate in data-driven decision making. And that's kind of what I'm going to talk a little bit about today. But what's interesting about it is that every decision that you make in, the bla in blackjack, and because it's such a closed system, every decision you make is completely correct and completely data-driven. So the data-driven decision making calls for me at this time to make two hand, to bet two hands of $10,000. I'm 21 years old. I just learned the system. I trained for six months. I'd been in the casino playing for three to four months, and here I am. And I bet two hands of 10000 the most I'd ever bet. The dealer gives me a pair of nines and an 11 and has a five up. So the pair of nines, what do I do? I got to split them. So that means I get to play each nine separately. I put another $10,000 down. On the first nine, I get a two to make 11. What do I do? Double down. I put another $10,000 down. I get an eight to make 19. The last nine, I get a 10 or a jack to make 19. The 11 against the five, what do I do? 
I do. So I double down. I put another $10,000 down. I get an eight on that to make 19. So I have 19, 19, 19 against the dealer's five. How much money do I have on the table? I can't believe how bad people are at math. <laughs> I, you know, and I'm, it's not just this crazy. It's fifty thousand dollars. I was speaking at like the National Accounting Association, and I asked this. It's all accountants, and I asked them this question, and none of them get it right. I'm like, what am I paying you people for? I'm not. I'm never gonna have an accountant again. Uh, so, fifty thousand dollars, and I have nineteen, nineteen, nineteen. The dealer has a five up, flips a six to make eleven, and then gets a king to make twenty-one. I lose fifty thousand dollars. This woman behind me shrieks, oh my God, that's my entire mortgage. I want to turn around and go, where the hell do you live? Because in San Francisco, where I live, that's a cardboard box and a tenderloin. So, but again, like this is one of those moments like where you can't be emotionally biased and you can't let things influence you. And, and, and now the math and all the data calls for me to bet three hands of 10,000. So this is kind of one of those moments in time where you flash back and you wonder like how in the world at 21 years old and just lost $50,000 did I get here. Well, I graduated from MIT in 1994 with a mechanical engineering degree that I've never used in my life, which is awesome to my parents. Um, I went into the world of finance, um, and then uh, I was in Chicago for a couple of years. Because back in those days, so in 1994 was right when the internet was like kind of invented. Thank you, Al. So the, you know, the Al Gore joke, the internet joke is like a terrible joke, right? Everyone's tired of it. But like I, my spin on it is now that Al Gore has invented two things, one good, one bad. He invented the internet, which is great, but then he invented global warming, which has been bad for us, so. It's funny if you're a Republican, trust me. Um, I, I uh, do a lot of work on um, Fox Business, which is kind of a joke in itself, but on Fox Business, when I'm doing these television interviews, I always want to pull that Al Gore joke out, because I think it'll kill on that show. So anyways, in 1996, I went back to Boston. The whole internet thing was happening, and I started a bunch of companies. I started a company called GolfSpan, which was online golf instruction, which we sold to, um, eventually got sold to Demand Media. I started a company called Circle Lending, which we sold to Richard Branson, and he used to launch his Virgin Money brand in the US. Then I started a company called ProTrade, and um, we eventually morphed it to Citizen Sports. But the interesting thing about ProTrade was it was kind of motivated, it was kind of inspired by the book in the movie Moneyball, at that time just the book. And it was kind of all about how to try to use data to make better sort of performance uh, measurements on athletes. And we eventually moved it into another um, company called Citizen Sports, which we sold to Yahoo. And so I always kind of got, was fascinated by this idea of sort of human performance and whether you can measure human performance better and whether you could use data and analytics to measure human performance. And so, so now I'm working on a company called 10Xer, which I tell you guys a little bit about. So the idea of it is that in our day, in our work, we produce a ton of data, whether it's email, whether it's check-ins, whether it's you know, commits, whether it's uh, tasks or you know, bugs or anything that we're tracking. And if we take that data and leverage it for, for good, to understand more about our own performance or more about the performance of the people that work for us, we can actually start to create something that we call managerial intelligence. And so there's already a ton of data in our lives, and all you guys that are technical know, I mean, we, we spend time looking at what our customers are doing, we spend time looking at our, what our servers are doing, and there's tons of companies out there helping us with this. But the data that we're talking about, and we focus primarily on software engineers, so we're, we're focusing on things like GitHub, Pivotal, Atlassian, um, whatnot. And we let people basically connect those services to our platform, and then we provide cool things on top that help them analyze the data, help them visualize the data, help them get insights from the data about how their team is doing and how their team could improve or how their individuals on their team could improve. So that's what I'm doing now. But what's more interesting is to talk more about the cool blackjack stuff. So what I want to talk about first is some lessons, entrepreneurial lessons, and business lessons in general that you can learn from the um, blackjack world. So the first is to be data-driven. Okay, Now, to beat blackjack, the first thing that you need to know is something called basic strategy. So what basic strategy is, is it's this matrix which shows you what to do at every hand of the blackjack table. And if you guys have not seen this card, uh, I have it in the back of the book that I wrote, which is called The House Advantage, Playing the Odds to Win Big in Business, which is available on Amazon. 
you guys are interested right now, there's Wi-Fi in here. You can order it, and I'll stop for a second. Um, but this, this card tells you what to do at every hand of the blackjack table. And following this card perfectly, so and you can even put this card on the table with you, raises the average blackjack player loses about 3% of the money they put on the table. Just learning basic strategy perfectly raises your odds from 3% from 3% to half a percent. So now you're only losing half a percent of the money you put on the table. But for some reason, okay, people don't want to follow basic strategy. And there's a lot of reasons why. But one is really interesting. It's something called omission bias. And there was a professor at UCLA by the name of Bruce Carlin. And what he did is he did studies not on actual blackjack, but on the way that people played blackjack and basically the cognitive or psychological biases that cause people to make mistakes in blackjack. And so what he found is that four times the amount of mistakes that were made at blackjack were people favoring inactivity over activity. So basically, they'd rather passively make a mistake than actively make a mistake. So the classic example of this is if I have 16 and the dealer has a 9, okay, what do I do? You have to hit, right? I mean, which means you take another card. Because the theory there is that you have 16, you're, you're probably going to lose. The dealer has a 19 up, has a 9 up, which likely they have 19 or something good, and so they don't have to take a card, so you're going to lose if you do nothing. At least if you take a card, you have a chance to better your hand. But the problem is if you get 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, jack, queen, king, you're going to lose right away. So the bias, the psychological bias for people to passively say, okay, I don't want to do anything because I don't want to cause harm to myself, and instead I'll wait and hopefully the dealer will bust or whatnot. But it's the wrong decision. And this became like a very personal story to me, a personal lesson to me a few years ago um, when I wrote my book, The House Advantage, Playing the Odds to Win Big in Business, which is available on Amazon, as I mentioned. <laughs> when I wrote that book, the reason I wrote it was I wanted to write a very accessible book on data and analytics for people that would never have otherwise read a book on the subject. And so I was trying to get on some mainstream media, and I talked to a producer at Good Morning America. And she said, Jeff, I love your story. I love the book. But the reality is we're not a business show. So you have to tell me how this stuff can help you. Give me a very personal story of how this helped you in your life. And at that time, I didn't have a story. But that all changed about three years ago. I was at a conference in Lake Tahoe for a sales company, and I was basically speaking there. And after I got done speaking, I was driving back to San Francisco, and I was about to go do a 10-city speaking tour of Asia. And as I was driving home, my phone rings, and it's my dad. And my dad says, son, I have some bad news for you. And he said, what? And he says, well, your mom, and my mom was, I think, 75 at the time, your mom has uh, suffered a stroke. And I said, is it bad? And he said, yeah, it's pretty bad. So I, my parents live in, in near Boston in the wonderful city of Worcester. And, yeah, reminds people of Nice in the summertime. But w w Worcester, uh, it's such a terrible place. I mean, if you guys have ever been there, it's really, it really used to be a nice place and has now become this real shithole. So, um, so anyway, so I, I leave San Francisco. I, I cancel uh, my Asia trip, and I fly home to see my mom and my dad. And it turns out that my dad was correct. My mom's stroke was, was pretty bad, and she couldn't move the entire right side of her body. She couldn't speak, and she couldn't acknowledge me when I walked in the door. And as we collected there, my family, my sister showed up, and my dad, the neurosurgeon, pulled us aside, and he said, well, I want to go over your options with you. And we said, okay, what are their options? He said, well, the first option is, in this typical case, we do nothing. And we said, what do you mean you do nothing? Well, your mom is 75 and just suffered a, a pretty big brain trauma. We don't want to make it any worse. So we'll just kind of sit back and hope that the blood resorbs and then everything is OK. And I said, well, what are her chances of surviving if you do that? And he said, well, you have a 22% chance to survive past 60 days. I said, OK, I don't really like those odds. And he said, well, actually, you know, I have a, I have a different option, but it's really risky. And we could go in and we can operate right now. She may still be bleeding. It's, it's a risk. And you put, have to put her on a ventilator. And we could do more damage. But if we can relieve that pressure right now, I think it gives her the best chance of leading a normal life again. And so as soon as he says this, I have this vision and this epiphany of it being the same thing as hitting 16 versus a 9. It's not a very popular thing. But if you just stand at 16 and against 9, you're going to lose over 20% of the time. I mean, over 80% of the time. So. As he's saying this, I stand up and I start talking about blackjack and how this is just like blackjack, and I go on and on. My sisters and my dad are like, this blackjack shit has gone to his head. 
But as I keep talking, they realize I'm right. And after about 20 minutes, they say, okay, let's operate. So they went in, they operated. The next day, my mom started to perk up a little bit. And two days later, she started to talk a little bit again. And I felt comfortable enough that I wanted to um, keep my commitments in Asia. And I took off and went to Asia. But as I was leaving, I was getting married nine months later. I said to my mom, I just want to make sure you can dance with me at my wedding. And she said, okay, that'll be easy. So I'm proud to say that nine months later, my mom did dance with me at my wedding. And she has come back a lot. Um, she now can you know, drive and speak and starting to cook and do all those things. And she suffers from aphasia, which is not being able to say what you want to say, which is clearly something that runs in the family. So that's fine. Um, but I, I do owe the whole notion of being able to make that difficult decision on understanding the idea of omission bias and not favoring inactivity over activity. Some other things that, that are pretty interesting about basic strategy is it really dispels this notion of the gut feeling. Because if you and I play blackjack together for a year and we just sit at the same table, and you're using your gut and I'm using this card, I will always do better than you over the course of a year, always. And I like to say, I'm actually heading up to Boston um, to this conference that MIT puts on, which is for sports and analytics. Um, I'm heading up there later. And there's a guy there that I like to call the most dangerous human being in America, and his name is Malcolm Gladwell. And the reason that Malcolm is dangerous is because Malcolm can take a really, really, really wrong, false idea and paint a really good story around it, which makes us all believe it's true. And the notion of being able to blink or use your gut to make decisions is just not true. If I asked you, would you rather have more data or less data to make a decision, you'd want more data. It's like that little, those little kid commercials, right? More is better. Uh, so basic strategy will, will illustrate that and teach you that very well. Another thing that I love about basic strategy is there's this whole idea of understanding the difference between outcomes and decisions. Right? Decisions don't always lead, good decisions don't always lead to good outcomes and vice versa. So understanding separating decisions and outcomes is really important. A great way to illustrate this is this idea that to say like, hey, don't focus on the result, focus on the process. And as you guys think about your careers and your lives and what you're doing, you know, like, think about that. Sometimes we're too results driven. And the idea is if I have 16 and the dealer has a, like, let's say like after this tonight, we go drive down to Foxwoods, I mean, to Foxwoods Casino or Atlantic City, right? And I'm standing behind you drinking a beer because they won't let me play blackjack there. And you have 16 and the dealer has a nine up and you ask me what to do. And I say, you hit there. If you get five to make 21, I'm a genius. But if you get six to make 22, I'm a moron that they never should have made a movie or a book about. But in both cases, the decision was absolutely correct. In one case, it led to a good result. In one case, it led to a poor result. So separating the decision from the outcome is super important. So why is blackjack beatable? And what can we learn from that? To understand truly why blackjack is beatable, we have to contrast it to some other games. So everyone, all of you guys have played roulette before, right? Or seen roulette, understand roulette. The greatest thing the roulette tables did or the casino people did is they put a magical sign above the roulette wheel which shows the results of the last 20 spins. And if the last six have been red, you should bet black, correct? Doesn't it doesn't matter. Every spin of that roulette wheel is independent. The same thing is true of craps. And we all walk up to tables. And if any of you guys ever played craps, I'm sure you've done this. You've said, how's this shooter been? How's this table been? Well, probably about the same as every other table. <laughs> but blackjack is different. If I take all four aces out of a deck of cards, what do you think the chances, and hand you that deck of cards, what do you think the chances you're dealing yourself blackjack are? Zero. There's no more aces left. So blackjack is a game with the memory like an elephant. And the other games don't have memories like fish. <laughs> Hence the graphics up there. <laughs> okay. No one ever gets that. It's fine. So there was an MIT professor by the name of Edward Thorpe. And he was a UCLA postdoc, went to MIT to be a professor. And um, this is in the 1960s. And he had an IBM 704 computer, which was one of the first computers in the world, huge mainframe computer. And Ed Thorpe is sitting there, and he did simulations on the game of blackjack. And what he found is that when there were a lot of, when, when there were no, when there were a lot of low cards remaining in the deck, so twos, threes, fours, fives, and sixes, when there's a lot of those left, it's in the dealer's favor. 
when there's a lot of high cards left, tens, face cards, aces, it's in the player's favor. And sevens, eights, and nines are roughly neutral. So all that you do when you're counting cards is you track the cards that you've seen to understand what cards are remaining. And you bet more when you've seen a lot of low cards so you know there's a lot of high cards left. And you bet less when you've seen a lot of high cards and you know there's a lot of low cards left or you just walk away from the table. And that's all it is. And learning how to do this properly, you can get about a 2% edge over the casino. So you don't have to be an autistic savant to do it, blah, blah. OK, now here are some more interesting stories that are relevant to you guys and have very little to do with analytics. So how many of you guys are, are uh, like uh, founders or entrepreneurs in here? Just a lot of you guys. So what's interesting is that you know, people always used to ask me, like, what was the most important thing that you looked for when you recruited a new person to play blackjack? And they always expect me to say, like, really good at math or, like, really analytical, really data-driven. No. I mean, you're going to hand someone $100,000 in cash and tell them to win you lots of money in Vegas. What's the thing you care the most about? That you can trust them. Right? And then the trust issue becomes even more apparent as you think about the way that our team works. Our teamwork, and you guys have seen in the movie, there'd be four or five of us would walk into a casino and four people would be at different tables and they would be collecting data from those tables and then they would signal to me and I would walk up and they would pass that information off to me. So I have to trust definitively that they are giving me the right data and trust that data um, implicitly. Now what's interesting about that is it reminds me a lot of being an entrepreneur. So I've started four different companies and every company that I started when I first started was like me and one other person. And then as you get bigger, it becomes you and a bunch of people. And all those jobs that you used to do and you knew were done correctly are now being done by other people. And if you don't trust them to effectively do their job, if you micromanage them, then your organization is never going to be able to scale. And there is a, a football team in New England called the New England Patriots, who I'm a big fan of growing up in Boston. Um, but they have a really interesting strategy, management strategy for their wide receivers. And it's called complex, it's called context, not control. So the idea is their wide receivers don't really have patterns. They're told some context and they're, they have an ability to basically change their patterns on the fly based on what they think can happen. And this management style of context, not control is something that I try to employ in my companies. And in and, and my last, this last company that I'm doing, I'm not having a lot of good luck in it. I'm, I'm feeling myself trying to control people a lot more. But giving people context and letting them basically make their own decisions is the best way to manage people ultimately. And that relies a lot on trust. So one of the things that really became important at my company, 10Xer, that is this whole idea of unlocking intrinsic motivation. So the idea, you know, everyone's heard of gamification or game mechanics and all that kind of stuff. Well, the reality is at the core of game mechanics is just this idea of how do you make people intrinsically motivated. And that's one of the things we were trying to do at 10Xer is to actually give people the metrics and the data to make them understand how they're getting better and how they're improving and then therefore become more intrinsically motivated. Some other things that made us successful as a blackjack team that I think about a lot in my entrepreneurial life is communication and the ability to really communicate and talk. And we kind of joke about communication in the blackjack world like, as I mentioned, like, we'd walk up to a table and the person at the table would have to try to pass information off to us, but we'd have to act like we didn't know each other. So we had code words for, for each number 1 through 20. Like, our number for, pay, for 15 was paycheck. So I might walk up to the table and my teammate would look at the dealer and say, man, you just took my whole paycheck. And then I would know right away that the table was 15, and so that was our code words. But some of the guys on the team had a lot of trouble coming up with these sentences on the fly, and they would get performance anxiety when I walked up. And my friend Neil, one time when I walked up, I could tell he was getting nervous and antsy, and he didn't know what to say. And our number for 16 is sweet, like sweet 16. So I think he had decided that no matter what the dealer gave him, he was going to yell sweet and celebrate. So the dealer gave him a 10, and he yelled sweet and celebrated. Now, the problem was that he had 12, and he busted, and the de but the, his suite was so convincing that the dealer thought he won and still paid him. So. <laughs> so metrics. Very, we were very metrics driven, and I'm sure all of you guys, and I, I looked at the agenda today, there's, there's lots of talk. I mean, metrics are so important right now, and the idea, I think one of the things that, that people don't understand is that like, really being metrics driven is a huge investment. 
you have to start from the beginning and you have to start collecting data and you have to start collecting data over time because you can't just start becoming metrics driven. You have to do it. And like at the Blackjack team, we were so metrics driven, everything. We collected data about when we played, who was there, what situations we played and how many hands we played, all that kind of stuff. So metrics are super important. And then transparency. Now, um, True Ventures is an investor in my company, a big investor in Spree. And I was at the True Ventures CEO Summit, and we were talking about different things like transparency. And one of the CEOs of one of the portfolio companies basically said, you know, he operates under the premise that one day a spreadsheet with everyone's salary and everyone's equity amount is going gonna, is gonna to mysteriously appear on the printer, and everyone in the company is going to see it. And he wants to operate his company with that level of transparency. And in the blackjack world, we had that level of transparency because everyone knew how much everyone was making. It was all very clear. And it made for a very good um, aligned um, culture where we could thrive off things like competition. And what's interesting about competition is like in sales, you often see it. But competition within an organization is a really interesting motivator. Um, in the blackjack world, we had competition. And, and it works well when really you have everyone with very aligned incentives. And we had very aligned incentives in Blackjack. And I remember, actually, there was a guy that was a good friend of mine named Wes. And Wes and I were probably the two of the best players on the team. So we got very competitive about who would win the most amount of money. And um, again, we were aligned. Like when Wes won, I won. So it was a healthy competition. And I remember one weekend in Vegas, I think it was July 4th, it was going to be our best weekend ever if on Sunday we won $60,000. So I went down, and I played, and I played, and I played. And after about three hours, I was up about $67,000. So I stopped, and I went upstairs to my room in the Mirage, happy that we had broken our you know, record. And then about 20 minutes later, Wes walked in the door. And Wes was holding a pillowcase over his shoulder, which in itself was very odd. So I said to Wes, I said, hey, did you play? And he said, yeah. And he said, did you play? And I said, yeah. And I was really proud of myself. I said, I won 67000 We broke the record. And I go, oh, no, you didn't lose, did you? He goes, no, I played and I won. I actually won 167000 It's all in this pillowcase. And he started beating me over the head with it. <laughs> what was cool about that weekend, as I said, it was our biggest weekend ever. And at the end of the weekend, basically, you know, imagine you have this huge sum of money. And it's all in cash and chips. You can't leave it in your room. It won't fit in the safe, and you can't put it in a bank. So you carry it around in a ratty duffel bag, which is what we did. We have it in this ratty duffel bag, and Wes and I are the only two people left in town. So we're sitting at the Mirage Pool, because it's July 4th in Vegas, and it's so hot. And we have this ratty duffel bag stored underneath this lawn chair. And as we're sitting there, I look at Wes, and I say, hey, Wes, do you think we can just leave this bag here and maybe go for a swim? It's not like anyone knows what's in there. And he says, well, how much is in there? And I said, well, it's the money we brought out here, $450,000. And the money we won, $540,000. So it's about $990,000 total. Do you think we can just leave it here? And he said, I don't see why not. It's not like it's a million dollars. So. <laughs> OK. I think one of the cool things about Blackjack is it really taught me how to make difficult decisions. So there I am, Jeffrey the dealer, in case you guys didn't believe me. That's my <laughs> wonderful outfit I got to wear on screen. No one's really impressed, are they? Uh, I always have this up as a joke, but I always have this up also as a, a reminder of one of the most difficult decisions I ever had to make at the table. So those of you guys that have played blackjack, do you, have you ever split tens? Raise your hands if you split ten. You guys are invited to my casino when I open it up any time. <laughs> Unless you're counting cards, there's absolutely no reason to ever split tens. But now, imagine that I told you guys that card counting is the knowledge of how many tens, face cards, and aces remain versus twos, threes, fours, fives, and sixes. And let's say you're towards the end of the deck, and you know almost every card you've seen is a t you haven't seen is a ten, a face card, or an ace. And let's say that you have a pair of tens, and the dealer has a six up. Do you think maybe then you might want to split those tens? Well, there's math that supports this, and the math is pretty strong that says there's this threshold where you know that it's actually a really good decision to split those tens. And it's a very profitable thing for you, because you basically have an opportunity to make twice what you would have made with, without splitting your tens. So I had just learned the strategy, and I walked into the MGM Grand, and I bet two hands of 8,000. And the dealer gave me a blackjack on the first one, and then gave me <coughs> a uh, pair of tens on the second one. 
and the dealer had a six up. So I looked at the cards on the table, and I was like, oh, my God, I, I should split these. I, the math says I should split these. So I have $8,000 on the table. The dealer pays my blackjack $12,000, and then moves on to my 20 and starts to go buy my 20. And I said, excuse me, ma'am, I think I want to split those. And she said, you want to what? And I'm like, I think I want to. And then I started trailing off, and I didn't want to split those. And I'm like, why am I having such a hard time making this decision? I know the math is so strong that supports that I should do this. And then I realize as I look around the table and I look behind me and I look up at the peep crowd of people that are now gathered behind me, that everybody thinks I'm a moron if I split these tens. And everyone is going to hate me if I split these tens. And everyone's going to want to kill me if I split these tens. And I'm falling for something called groupthink, right? Where I am making a decision to avoid conflict. I'm making a decision that I think is like the consensus decision. And the issue is that these people looking around me, they don't have the data, the technology, or the innovation that I have. If they did, would they want to split these tens? Maybe, maybe not. But at least they wouldn't hate me for it. So I can't be swayed by avoiding conflict. And if you think about the decisions that we face as entrepreneurs or as people in big companies or as people trying to do things different, the way the technology landscape shifts every day is causing us to do much different things than we ever would do. And there are always going to be unpopular decisions if you want to innovate. And if you worry about groupthink, if you worry about avoiding conflict, you're never going to innovate. But then I think about this more, and I'm like, all right, fine. I don't give a crap what any of these people say, but I still don't want to split these tens. And I wonder why that is. And I realize it's because I have 20. And 20 is a winning hand. And I don't want to give up a winning hand. But that's not the right way to think about it. That's something called loss aversion, where we're all impacted by a loss. Yeah, that's sad, Keanu. Where we all are impacted by a loss more than we are by a gain of the same amount. We're afraid of losing. We'd rather, you know, we'd rather avoid that situation, avoid that risk. When I moved out to Silicon Valley in 2004, a bunch of my friends and I were all using products from this company called Apple. And we were like, this company's stock is trading at 60. We should probably buy some Apple. So we did. And 11 months later, Apple went to 120. And my buddies and all I said, they, they all came to me and they said, hey, we're going to sell our Apple. I said, why? And they said, well, we just made 100% return. Why would we be greedy? We want to capture that, right? I mean, if you make 100% return in 11 months, that's amazing. Why would you risk that? Well, do you think Apple's a buy or sell at, at 120? Well, we actually still think it's a buy. Well, why would you sell it? Because we don't want to lose any money. We don't want to be greedy. You know, the decision to buy or sell Apple should have nothing to do with whether you own it. That's something called endowment bias, where you become protective of what you have versus actually thinking about how you can gain things. There's another company in the Valley that I've spoken at twice. It's a company called Facebook. And the first time I spoke at Facebook, they had 30 million users. 13 months later, I went back there to speak. And they were announcing, it was the day they announced their 500 millionth user. And what do they even have now? Like a couple, uh, over a billion now? Everyone know what their number is? I guess with WhatsApp now, they have a lot. <laughs> uh, and as I'm telling the story, I'm like, you guys are a perfect example. Now that you guys are at you know, 500 million users, are you guys going to take the same written? And before the words were even out of my mouth, Chamath, does anyone here know Chamath? Chamath is sitting in the back row. He's an executive there at the time. He screams, hell yeah, meaning he knew they were going to have to still take risks if they wanted to succeed. Well, I think they just took a really big risk. So I think they really are doing what he said they're going to do to try to continue to grow and innovate. So this idea of not being loss averse, right, of, of trying to gain as much wealth as possible, that's really the key to all of this. So I can't be loss averse. I go tell the dealer, I'm going to split these tens. I put another $8,000 down. The dealer gives me an ace on the first one to make 21 and a nine on the second make one to make 19. The dealer flips a six to make, uh, sorry, a 10 to make 16 and then gets another 10 to make 26, and I win my $16,000. I run away from the table because the shoe's over and everyone wants to kill me. But uh, you know, it was, it was a much more profitable moment because I 
decided to split those tens. So finally, I'm sure all of you guys have been wondering, like, oh, what happened to him at the beginning of the story? Like, am I going to have to read that dumb book he keeps talking about to figure out what happens? I mean, what's going to happen? Uh, well, let me set the stage again. I just learned the system using math to be the casinos, lost $50,000, believe in data, believe in being data driven. And now the math calls for me to bet three hands of $10,000. So I do. And I believe in data. And I believe in you know, learning from failure and whatnot. And on the first one, I get a nine. On the second one, I get a 19. On the third one, I get an ace four. Now the nine against the six is a hand that I should double down. That's what the math tells me to do. So I put another $10,000 down there. And I get a queen to make 19. The ace four against the six is actually another hand that I double down soft 15. So I do, and on that I get a 4 to make 19. So I have 19, 19, 19 again against the dealer 6, and I have another $50,000 on the table. So basically a chance to win back everything I just lost or to lose two of those women's houses. <laughs> so this is one of those moments where you're just like, okay, the only reason I'm here is because I believe in math, I believe in data, I believe in being data-driven. The dealer flips a king to make 16, and then gets a five to make 21. So I lose another $50,000. I'm devastated. The shoe's over, so I walk up from the table, stumble up to my room at Caesar's Palace, collapse on the floor. Stare up at the ceiling, wonder to myself, why is there a mirror up there? But <clears throat> I was only 21. I'm like, what do we do? People lie in bed and get ready? It's weird. So. Once I get over this whole idea of the mirror, I suppose, I start thinking about what am I going to do next. And the decision of what to do next kind of pray, played with me. The first thing I started thinking about was, you know what, like maybe just kind of put the decision off and not play anymore this weekend and maybe play next weekend. Well, that would be favoring inactivity over activity. And then I started thinking about, you know, some of the other things that I've talked about, like I think one of the things that I haven't talked about today but I think is really interesting or really important is having a long-term perspective or having a time horizon that's more than just a week. And as entrepreneurs, I think we tend to feel like our time horizon is really short. But the reality is you, you can't think that way because it will make you make bad decisions. So in a longer time horizon, had I done well in blackjack, yeah, I lost these last two hands, but I'd done well in general. And then I think about things like, had I made the right decision and just suffered a poor outcome, or had I made a wrong decision? And I, I felt pretty confident, and I could do the math in my head that I made the right decision and just gotten unlucky. And then I think a lot about the idea of being loss averse, and if I'm going to win any more money, I need to risk some more money to do it. So I've, I've told this story a bunch of times, and the story is, took a turn about three years ago. I was uh, Coastal Ventures is also an investor in my company. I was telling this um, story at a Kosla event. And Vinod Kosla is, is obviously a legendary, uh, uh, legendary VC in the Valley. He was the you know, original founder of Sun Microsystems and was the original, one of the big Kleiner partners. And as I'm telling the story at, at Vinod's event, now keep in mind that the speaker right before me was a guy by the name of Bill Gates. So speaking right after Bill Gates is already intimidating enough, but then having Vinod sit in the front row and be on his Blackberry the whole time is even more intimidating. And as I get to the story, in the middle of the story, Vinod stands up, and he looks at me, and he goes, I don't believe you. And I go, what do you mean? He goes, I don't believe you. How could you? How could you? Uh, how could I what? How could you doubt yourself? How could you have ever thought about quitting? And I realized, as he said this to me, that he was right, that I never really thought about quitting. And I think if there's one thing to think about as you think about your lives as entrepreneurs and, and your lives and your careers, is if you have something that you really believe in, if you have a strategy that you really believe in, you don't quit and you don't walk away when there's short-term failure. Um, my, one of my main investors is a guy by the name of Kevin Compton, and Kevin was the first money in Citrix. And he talks about how they rode Citrix down to zero money in the bank three different times. The day that Citrix went public, they had $120,000 in the bank. And they were like a 14x return now since they went public. That idea of sticking with something and of really embracing failure and learning from it is something we do in the Valley, something we do as entrepreneurs. But it's something that you really should believe in. 
So I went down and I kept playing. And over the next day and a half, two days, I won $100,000 back. The last day I was there, I won $70,000. And I really do believe that that moment is sort of what's made me successful as an entrepreneur. It's this ability to understand, be data-driven, but also understand that you've got to stick with things. So if I had quit, then I never would have had a movie made about me, a book about me, and I never would have got to come talk to you guys today. So thank you for the time. Yeah, if we can do, if anyone has questions, we can do questions. I would assume that like the pre-lunch spot like gets no questions because people are already hungry and stuff like that. Questions, anyone? Yeah, sure, back there. Go ahead. Uh, just related to uh, the movie 21, I wasn't a huge fan of it because I felt like there was a lot more in the uh, the book that was more interesting than they put on screen. Just curious about your personal opinion. Yeah, but that, it's kind of always the way it is. Like, in the unfortunate part about life is that movies are not made for people like us, right? Movies are made for people that actually go on opening night and, like, you know, like, it, it's just a different world. And I actually, when I saw the movie the first time, I saw it in a small screening room. And it was me, Ben Mesrick, the writer, and Lawrence Fishburne, the three of us were watching it together. And I left that movie, and I was like, God, that, that was terrible. And I was like thinking to myself. But then I saw it in, a, uh, in, like a, in Boston, where we did a small like, premiere in Boston. And I saw it with all my friends and a bunch of people, and like, there was a crowd. And, you know, it's a fun movie. It's not a great movie, but it's a fun movie. And there's like, moments where, which are great. And, and, and yes, the book's more interesting. But I would tell you that my life is actually even more interesting than the book. So it's like <laughs> you take like this you know, seven, eight year span and then compress it into 300 pages and then further compress that into an hour and a half. And of course, you're going to lose a lot in the medium. So, uh, yeah. Great talk. Um, Thank you. I was wondering what you uh, think of Arthur Chu, Jeopardy guy. Sorry? I was wondering what you think of Arthur Chu. I don't know why people make such a big deal out of this. I read the article that was actually like a, that actually said something about how he's just like really good at social media, so he's really been good at like riling people up. And I think the mainstream's view of being really good at social media is understanding how to tweet. So, um, <laughs> but like, yeah, I, I mean, I don't, I don't think much of it at all. I mean, it's cool to see. It's, I don't know. I don't think much of it at all. I mean, I think it's an interesting story, and it's interesting that. Have you guys read the article? It was basically like a guy that was a predecessor of him that did the exact same thing he did, but no one cared about it because. They didn't, he didn't do much with the social media or promotion around it. But the, he employed the same strategy that everyone thinks Arthur is a, a pain for doing. So. Okay, guys, thank you. <laughs>